This is a production of PBS Charlotte. 15 years before the Civil War. This county broke away from Lincoln County in 1846. The North Carolina legislature named it Gaston County and established the first county seat in Dallas. The gentleman that, that built this area wanted to show that Gaston County was the place to come. This is the land of opportunity. The courthouse served as the centerpiece of the town, surrounded by a jail, businesses, hotels, and homes. All the buildings that face the square, for the most part, were built before 1905. But these were structures that were built to last. Historic criminal cases that took place inside this courtroom are still talked about today. I think the John Campo case is interesting because it draws in historians with the question of, what if? This arrest saved John's life. Caroline's ship is probably the story that you hear most here in our area. Here's a woman standing on trial for murdering her two-year-old son. And her only defense was her own word. At the turn of the 20th century, an industrial boom disrupts the seat of power. Texas were huge. the largest textile um, producing county uh, in North Carolina and was essential to the entire United States at one point in time. But Dallas was left behind as Gastonia boomed. One of the worst things that ever happened to Dallas was the county seat moving away. One of the best things that ever happened to the town of Dallas was the county seat moving away. Join us as we explore Gaston County's early history and meet the people working to preserve it. That and more right here on A Trail of History. The following episode of Trail of History is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Bragg Financial Advisors, a family-owned wealth management firm providing investment management and tax and estate planning for families, individuals, and institutions for more than 50 years. Committed to our clients, to education, and our community. Hello and welcome to A Trail of History. I'm Gary Ritter. Did you know that Gastonia wasn't always the county seat of Gaston County? The first county seat was right here in Dallas, complete with a county courthouse and a jail. And you can learn more about both on the Gaston County Museum's walking tour of downtown Dallas. Starting in front of the old Hoffman Hotel. All right, we all ready to get started. We'll We'll jaywalk across the street and get, get going. Museum director Jason Luker leads a walking tour of the square. This county broke away from Lincoln County in 1846. The area that we're standing on was Jesse Holland's land. He was the son of the local minister at the Long Creek Baptist Church, uh, Julius Holland. And he was part of the group that wanted to get Gaston County separate from Lincoln County. The state legislature named the new county after William Gaston a United States Congressman and North Carolina Supreme Court Justice from the eastern part of the state. Then, in early 1847, the real work began. The first courts met uh, in early 1847, and that's when they started assigning duties to create the town uh, and to build the buildings. Within that town, they laid the streets, they put the courthouse in the middle, very similar or exactly like they had, like was in Lincolnton. They hired a guy named Lonegren, uh, who lived in the eastern part of the county to be the contractor for building the official buildings of the town, like the jail, the courthouse. Well, this is the courthouse. Construction began pretty much right when the, the uh, land was set by, by, uh, by Holland. It was finished by 1848. It served as the county seat from 1848 to 1911. The two-story brick building survived a fire in 1874, and later the brick was stuccoed over and painted white. Since 1911, the building has served as a fire department, school, and even a dance hall. Back on the tour, Luger explains how Gaston County handled criminals when Dallas served as the county seat. You'd be housed in the jail on the second floor until the judge came, then you'd be brought over for your trial inside on the second floor. And in the 1870s, a man named John Campo found himself in that very situation. 
a soldier in the U.S. Cavalry, Campo's unit, under the orders of President Ulysses S. Grant, came to Gaston County during Reconstruction due to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Vigilante groups begin to pop up over the South and the Deep South. He sees as President of the United States that the country is tearing itself back apart again. Specifically, the South is tearing itself apart with these vigilante groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. And so Grant finally had to you know, send federal troops into the South in order to squash these vigilante groups, um, arrest them, put them on trial, and then secure the rights of those that had formerly been oppressed and were now free. They were staying in the area. John was part of that group. He was from Wisconsin. And he was apparently in need of some cavalry boots. He went to a local store, a Moore and Lewis store, and apparently helped himself. The wheels of justice moved slowly for John Campo. He spent eight months locked up here inside the old Gaston County Jail without a trial. During that time, no one notified his cavalry unit of his arrest, and he was considered a deserter. So while he's in jail, incarcerated here in Gaston County, his unit, the U.S. 7th Cavalry, has moved out west to Wyoming, and it's under the leadership of the, one of the most infamous generals of the era, uh, George Custer, and, and we all know what happens at Little Bighorn. Custer and his men are entirely wiped out, and Campo survives simply because he's accused of stealing a pair of boots. Eventually, Campo did stand trial and was found guilty of theft. But after serving his sentence, despite all the problems Campo had, he chose to make Dallas his permanent home forever and became a stonemason. Numerous examples of Campo's stonework remain in Dallas, like these stone posts around the square. Perhaps the most notable example, the stone steps in front of the old courthouse where Campo stood trial. Today, the old courtroom serves as a community space. But in the fall of 1891, a jury decided the fate of a mother accused of murdering her child. Caroline Shipp was a, a uh, uh, African-American who lived in the eastern part of, of the county near Mount Holly area. She was um, known as a free spirit. In some, in some categories, and that was kind of code name for being uh, inappropriate, where she had had uh, multiple relationships. One of those relationships was with a man named Mac Farr. And supposedly the story was that Mac, at least, did not want to have anything to do with the child, but he wanted to have everything to do with Caroline. So supposedly the child was poisoned. Both Caroline and Mac were arrested. Mac had an alibi. Of, uh, some local men said that he had been working for them. Caroline had no alibi. As the trial went on, it became very uh, famous during the time period because here's a woman standing on trial for murdering her two-year-old son. And her only defense was her own word. In October of 1891, Caroline Shipp was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. And in the winter of 1892, all hangings were public events. Whenever there was a hanging, you would have families would come out, picnics would be brought, folks would come out and would observe it, uh, visit with friends, uh, and this was no exception. By some accounts, there was 3,000 to 5,000 people who came out to see Carolina ship hang. Story went that she, uh, she left her, her the jail here in town. She rode on the back of a wagon on top of her own coffin out to the gallows. And when she stood in front of 3,000 to 5,000 people, she adamantly stated that she did not murder her son and stated to everyone that today she will be with her son in heaven, with Jesus. This was so moving that it has been reported by several uh, newsmen at the time how staunchly she defended herself in front of everyone, how eloquent, how bold she was. Here was a black woman in the 1890s that had been convicted of a murder, able to stand in front of everybody, a mostly white crowd, and testify to them that she is no murderer, that Mac Fur was the one who actually killed her son. But the hanging went horribly wrong and forever changed how executions would take place in North Carolina. The noose uh, of the slipped and it was no longer right against the vertebrae. So when she fell, it didn't break her neck. 
and for about 20 minutes she hung there and suffocated in front of everybody. The death itself was so gruesome that immediately there was word in the newspaper that they should never do this ever again, that there should never be a public execution, and there never was. Caroline Ship was the last woman hung in North Carolina history. From its founding in 1846, county leaders intended Dallas to be the place everyone wanted to live. The gentleman that, that built this area wanted to show that Gassing County was the place to come. This is the land of opportunity. This is where the money is. This is where your future is. And we're going to show you by building these beautiful buildings like a brick courthouse, a brick jail, and this huge hotel. Following the Civil War, two key factors would lead Gaston County in new prosperous directions, but Dallas would pay the price. One of those factors included the railroad, something missing in Dallas. There was discussions of bringing it through Dallas. Many of the town's folks wanted it to come through Dallas. Some apparently did not. Anytime you bring something like that, like a major highway or a railroad, there's going to be some disruption, especially if it goes on your property. But the railroad moved to the area of what is now Gastonia. Around that area, there was a depot was built. Uh, and around that depot developed a town. Around that town developed uh, cotton manufacturing, especially with the development of electricity. Uh, and so what you had was you had significant growth to the point that by 1900, Gastonia was probably 20 times the size and population of Dallas. And as the population grew, so too did the need for county services. What you see is kind of like what, what happened between Lincoln and Gaston County. You know, the, the whole argument of where, you know, we, didn't, we wanted a new county so we don't have to travel up to Lincolnton, but really it's all about the business, happened again with Dallas. By the early 1900s, momentum was building to move the county seat away from Dallas. The first election, a referendum if you will, uh, the move was denied. The second referendum, the move was approved. And in 1911, Gastonia became the new Gaston County seat, leaving a time capsule of historic buildings in downtown Dallas. One of the worst things that ever happened to Dallas was the county seat moving away. One of the best things that ever happened to the town of Dallas was the county seat moving away because that was allowed for these homes to stay where they were and continue to be lived in as residencies. And it provided for the chance for these buildings to survive. I was really surprised by how many of the historical buildings are still standing um, around the square. I mean, all the buildings that face the square, for the most part, were built before 1905. When you walk the square of Dallas, you are truly stepping back in time for our county to see the homes connected to the, the, the industry around the court square, which is very unique. One of those unique buildings today houses the Gaston County Museum, but in its prime, the Hoffman Hotel offered comfort and luxury to weary travelers. Daniel Hoffman, the man who built it in 1852, was a wealthy entrepreneur in the area. He was much like the other guys who led the effort to get Gaston County created. Um, he was a farmer, he was a distiller, he had a tanning um, uh, area, he had a grist mill, a sawmill, and this hotel Best we can tell was his grandeur. This is his statement. This is his, his, uh, his piece that showed his wealth. It is a large brick five-story structure and it had 44 rooms in it. When it opened, it was the largest thing here in Gaston County. It would have multiple court weeks that would meet, usually once every quarter. Everyone would come in from the surrounding area to do their business, to take care of their disputes, need a place to stay, you can stay here at the Hoffman Hotel. It is one of at least four that we know here on the square, and, but it was the largest and housed the, and the most pristine. Nice uh, rooms, spacious rooms uh, for the time, uh, better than in, say in a boarding house where oftentimes you had to share the bed with other people. Uh, and so it was quite a, an innovation. Evidence uh, suggests, I don't know that there's any documentation, but certainly suggests that almost all the labor for the Huffman Hotel was done by craftsmen who were slaves, uh, and a, possibly a few free blacks as well. So the quality of the work has stood the test of time and is quite remarkable in that sense. 
While the buildings around the town square in Dallas are an impressive link to the past, the Hoyle Homestead is believed to be the oldest home in Gaston County. We think that it was built somewhere either prior to 1794 or around 1794. In 1794, John Hoyle sold his home place tract to his son Andrew. And so the house was either there already, John had built it, or Rich Andrew, which was his nickname, was Rich Andrew, uh, built it at a later time after, after he acquired the land. We're not sure which, neither one of them told us. We have looked for bricks and for, you know, carvings to tell us, and they, uh, they have not shared that information with us from 200 years ago. So we really don't know that, but certainly that is the time frame that we're looking at. But one thing is for certain, the construction methods were unique to North Carolina. This is not a log cabin. This was a timber post constructed house with log inlay. Most timber constructed houses had clapboard on the outside. This was not the case with the wall house. What they did was they put the house together with uh, the tenions and, and what they did then was, was that they inlaid it with logs. The unique architecture is a very uh, strong German influence. Uh, it is the only house with this architecture in North Carolina and one of the only houses south of Virginia with this unique architecture. Today, a volunteer board oversees preservation efforts at the Hoyle Historic Homestead and hopes to fully restore the building. Back in Dallas, the Gaston County Museum offers numerous exhibits and artifacts for visitors to experience. Like this exhibit, which shares the county's deep connection with textiles. Railroads and the introduction of electricity combined to make the county and Gastonia in particular a textile powerhouse. It just was a magnificent stroke. It, it, it made that town the center of the textile universe. So in 1880, there's about seven mills. By 1900, there's about 20 mills. By 1920s, there's 104, with the majority of them focused around Gastonia itself. It dominated for, for most of its, its existence from the, the high years of the 1920s to the, to the, the labor strikes of the, the late 20s and early 30s, to the rebirth in the 1940s during World War II, to the slow economic decline of the textile industry leading all the way to the 1990s. The center heart of that area of, of, of really North Carolina's textile industry was Gaston County. One unique artifact at the museum is this large piece of equipment called an Edison Dynamo. When it was installed at the McCadden Mill, it instantly became a disruptive force in the industry. Uh, the rumor is that Edison himself came down and, and installed it. This was the first electricity uh, light, electrical lights in Gaston County, uh, in McCadden Mill. So it was used to run the lights in the mill. This also changed how they operated. With electric lights, the mills could operate around the clock. I think a lot of times when you, we come to counties like Gaston County, uh, people think of it being kind of behind in the times. Um, not necessarily true, especially with the textile mills. They were looking for the bold and the new. Uh, when Rufus McCadden had bought this dynamo, it really changed how textile worlds operated in the South. But not everything in the mills and surrounding mill villages was positive. We have a, a, a spindle, which is always a big one with, with children. We're able to show them what a spindle machine uh, looks like and how it operated and tell them that this was a job called doffering that they could have been doing inside the mills, which both surprises, um, excites, and also shocks children of the day that they would be working 12 hours a day in front of one of these machines. Photographer Lewis Hine took pictures in mills across the country, including Gaston County. His photographs of children, like this girl working at a mill in Cherryville, helped change labor laws in the United States. What you see through Lewis High's photography is not necessarily showcasing that. These were hard areas to live in and to work in. The people had injuries. Uh, there's famous pictures of, of children with missing fingers, of um, uh, almost uh, people that were thin as rails living in these, these huddle shacks. 
uh, as a different version of the story that was being told through the newspaper and through um, the owners. Uh, it was a much more stark existence for a lot of these people that led ultimately to labor movements of the, of the later years in the 1900s. Labor issues at one of the largest mills in Gaston County came to a head in 1929. When Loray passed out of the Love and Gray family and you had outside ownership, uh, there's certainly that perception that the, the, the workers were not treated as family within the context of that mill village. They were asked to do more for less than money. Uh, they were asked to produce more uh, within a day's time for either the same or less money. And so this occurred in uh, Loray. Uh, the representatives happened to be uh, associated with the Communist Party. And that created a political issue in addition to a labor issue uh, which uh, gripped the country uh, with headlines coming out of Gastonia about the, the strike. And during the strike, tragedy struck. Uh, you have two prominent two people killed. One was the sheriff, Sheriff Adderholt was shot. Uh, and you have Elma Wiggins, who was a labor organizer, uh, who was also shot. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time. Upstairs at the Gaston County Museum, the staff works hard managing its vast collection, and Registrar Tim Heffner stays busy. Being a very small museum, like a lot of museums, we tend to have to be a jack of all trades. Rotating exhibits can be found on the second floor. This one's called Cabinet of Curiosities. The exhibit we have now, uh, there's just a few very unusual items in it. There's a perm machine that dates probably back to the 20s or 30s, uh, where ladies would get permanent waves put in, in their hair. It looks very scary. The museum has some items not on display, like this Bible that's hundreds of years old. It belonged to a local family and was produced in Europe using a Gutenberg printing press. The third floor of the museum shows visitors what it was like to stay in the old Hoffman Hotel. Outside the museum, this old railroad depot serves as an art gallery. And behind the Hoffman Hotel building, you'll find a modern day carriage house. The carriage house is a unique piece. It was actually uh, through the Stowe Foundation uh, who collected these carriages. And in the carriages, it's, a, it's showing the transportational styles, how people got around in the, in the 1800s and early, or early 1900s. According to the museum, it's the largest collection of carriages in North Carolina and was the personal collection of local philanthropist Daniel Stowe. Right now, on exhibit out in our uh, carriage house, we have 11 wheeled carriages. Uh, we have three sleighs, and we have one fire cart that we use, was used down at the uh, old orthopedic hospital on New Hope Road. Hefner calls this wagon the farm truck of its day. It's one of our, one of our few local wagons, that one, and of course the Tony's ice cream wagon is another local wagon. He would take it from their shop over to the Firestone Mill, the Loray Mill, and wait for shift changes for people to come out. Of course, people came out of the mill, they're probably hot, worn out, so ice cream would be a big draw, and, and uh, just events, gatherings, that sort of thing around town, he would show up with the ice cream cart and, uh, and sell it. Back out on the square in Dallas, as the walking tour concludes, we meet Craig Colton. I, I'm not originally from Gaston County. Um, I'm from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I've been here for, I don't know, 30 years, something like that. And um, I, I picked up bits and pieces of Gaston County history along the way, just out of, you know, curiosity. And so it was kind of great. It, it, it was kind of good to have, uh, to get focused on it here and, and listen to somebody talk that had a lot of, a lot of information on it. So. I, I enjoyed it a lot. The old courthouse square in Dallas serves as a great starting point into this region's past, and historians help all of us experience and understand Gaston County's diverse history. 
Thank you for watching this episode of A Trail of History. Production of PBS Charlotte.